Tema Talks is brought to you by the Tema Conter Memorial Trust, which is Canada's leading provider of peer support, family assistance, education and training for emergency services, public safety, military personnel, and their families. Check out tema.ca for more information. The views, opinions, and endorsements expressed in each podcast episode are those of the host and the guest alone, and do not necessarily reflect the official position of the Tema Conter Memorial Trust. The subject matter of this podcast may be triggering for some listeners. Please take the time to get yourself in a calm and positive mind space before listening so you can get the most out of the podcast. Okay, cue the music and enjoy this episode of Tema Talks. Hello, people, and welcome to Tema Talks. What's up with you? I hope you and yours are well. I and mine are doing fine. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode. I hope you enjoy it. A couple things, though, before we get into it. First thing, another shout-out to my brother, Kevin Davison. We've been best friends for over 30 years. Met met when I was 12 at a birthday dance party at the community center in New Minas. I still remember it like it was yesterday, anyway, and it's been an adventure ever since. It was my pleasure to be with him when he won the East Coast Music Award for Video of the Year for When Those Sirens Are Gone. It was awesome, and fitting, and well-deserved. Uh, you know, those of us, uh, those of you, sorry, from the East Coast... When I say that he beat out some amazing artists like Heather Rankin, you know, from the legendary Rankin family, this is a big deal. And it's all, and like I say, it's it's very fitting in this day and age with all the traumatic events that are going on in this country and outside this country. This video deserves it. So congratulations, Kevin, on this video. Thank you, ECMAs, for getting it right. It was awesome. Okay, second thing, I want to go over something that's that's bugging me a little bit and has started happening on social media. Organizations, big mental health advocacy organizations like I've Got Your Back 911 and the Tema Contra Memorial Trust and many others who do phenomenal work for those who are suffering and who need support sometimes get a little flack on social media when they post something and it does not include every single branch of first responder. I know this happened recently during the after the uh, Toronto incident and there was a uh, a picture going around and it had a, a firefighter and a police officer standing outside a theater you know, rever- referencing them as heroes, which they are. And then there were comments like, well, paramedics should be there as well. Okay, we need to stop that. Okay, th- there's there's just no need for that. I'm a big superhero geek, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an analogy for you. If I see a poster, a Marvel Studios poster, and it has Iron Man and Thor on it, touting them as superheroes, which they are, my first reaction is not, well, where the hell is Hulk, or Ant-Man, or Spider-Man, or any of the other Avengers. That's not my first go-to. I don't get upset by it. I don't think that Marvel has forgotten that there are other heroes in their universe. Sometimes, sometimes you're going to see posts and pictures and memes and all the other social media stuff that just isn't going to have every single branch of first responder on it. And we need to support that. We need to celebrate those who are in those posts. They deserve it. And listen, let's be real. The, the big three, you know, traditional first responder services, fire, police, and ambulance, there's no lack of love for them among first responder advocacy groups and support groups. Okay? No one's being left out. Now... There are some people we need to help that I think that we are doing a better, you know, a better job with, you know, corrections officers, search and rescue. But among the big three, 
you know, I don't think we have anything to complain about. And I think when when people react like that, it's just uh, it's very easy to do, and I've done it myself, so I totally understand it. It's easy to jump on the negative, and it's easy to to find a reason to be offended. We need to stop looking for a reason to be offended. Stop competing. Start supporting. That's just my opinion. Let me know what you think either way. I'd love to hear you. Love to hear from you any way you can reach out to me, okay? Anyway, that's my thought on that. And now I'll let that go. But stop it. Let's settle down, okay? People are doing good work. Lots of people are doing lots of good work. And there's still lots of work to do. Okay. My guest this episode is Richard LeBlanc. Really cool dude. Has a firefighting background and has developed a mental health app called Do, D-E-W. You're going to learn what that means in just a little bit. If you're like me and you're also a little bit of a techie geek, this may be really interesting for you. It was for me. And I think it could really help a lot of people in this day and age. And without getting into it a lot, you know, it just helps you check in with yourself and how you're doing, which is important. But don't take it from me. Let's hear it from Richard. He can explain it much better than me. Let's get to it. It was a dark and stormy night. Nor'easter rolling in. Welcome to Tema Talks, Richard. It's a pleasure to have you on. My pleasure is mine, actually, Sean. It's terrific that we finally got a chance to do this. I know this has been in the works for for a while. You've been really patient, and uh, finally we're here doing this, so it's great. Um, Richard, before we get into the, you know, basically the reason why I got tuned into you by Peter Tripp, a friend of mine, Peter Tripp, uh, the whole uh, your Do Mental Health app. Before we get into that, I want to learn a little bit more about you. So. What, what's your origin story? T- tell me about, you know, growing up and how you grew up and probably, you know, right up to the point where that led you to the fire service. Sure. Um, well, actually, I'm a native Newfoundlander, so oh, right I, I'm from the East, East Coast and, uh, you know, mid-60s uh, child and uh, grew up uh, in 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 Newfoundland, and then, like many Newfoundlanders, uh, family uh, migrated into Ontario. Um, I was actually born um, just with a single mother at the time, so that was not uncommon. And uh, right. she ended up leaving the island and uh, and taking me with her, and uh, ended up in Ontario um, and, and into a you know kind of a merged family situation. I uh, was adopted and uh, and then grew up, uh, you know, into my late teens there. Um, very interesting, uh, you know, when you get into those kinds of situations, there's, you know, a lot of interesting things that can come to the fore. And it wasn't a particularly pleasant uh, experience uh, for me. Uh, but you know it is what it is what it is uh, everybody kind of has their story and then uh, and then I ended up in Manitoba going to school there got my first degree uh, at the University of Manitoba had a great time there uh, really a kind of a uh, a chance to grow and spread my own wings and and you know move away from the family which was terrific I right. uh, did a lot of growing up at that time got involved in student politics and and all that good stuff and uh, when I was in Manitoba I met a girl and uh, and uh, she's a native Calgarian, and uh, I ended up in Calgary. So I've been kind of working my way way progressively west. <laughs> uh, I hit the yeah. big rocks in Calgary, and I've been here since uh, 1989. So okay. um, so um, settled here in Calgary, and and that's been great. Uh, we uh, we have three kids, uh, all in their early to mid 20s now. And, uh, and in 1991, I actually joined the uh, Calgary Fire Department. Uh, my goal at that time was to um, actually return to school after a couple years uh, hiatus. I was working in, actually, I was working in therapy at the time after my first degree when I moved to Calgary uh, with veterans. Uh, okay. So that was a very that was a very uh, interesting, uh, probably my best job. Uh, it's certainly my best job, and probably the best job I'll ever have. Huh. Um, what, got and that was in, what got you interested in the fire service? Why did you turn to that? Uh, well, the reason was at the time in the early 90s, uh, a fellow by the name of Ralph Klein came into power in Alberta. Right. And, uh, and Ralph Klein was cutting programs and services. Uh, and my wife actually also uh, worked for the government um, in corrections. Okay. And, uh, and so both of us were looking at it going, hmm. 
this is going to be a, a difficult situation. So I joined the fire department so that uh, I we could you know make a reasonable amount of money. And uh, but that also provided me the opportunity to go back to school. Actually, I was going to go back to school to become a physician. That was always the goal. Okay. And uh, and then uh, it wasn't long after that that she took a p- bit of a package because you know again the writing was all on the, on the wall with regards to anyone working either in directly in the government or even in the hospital system. I was in the hospital system. Right. And uh, and so uh, I went one way. Eventually, she uh, she took the package and. Um, and uh, and uh, and left the government as well. Uh, and on the fire department, I was there for about six years. Um, and uh, you know, life sometimes throws you curveballs. Um, yeah. And uh, we ended up um, pregnant um, with our firstborn. And uh, so I put the the goals of going back to medical school. Um, on hold and uh, they remain on hold. <laughs> so yeah, uh, often happens. So, you know, yeah, yeah, the best laid plans of mice and men, right? So, yeah. uh, so anyways, long story short, no, no regrets. Um, uh, we got three great kids, and uh, and it was never my goal to be on the fire department uh, for uh, forever. Right. Um, and uh, actually, a pretty entrepreneurial guy. My wife's very entrepreneurial. And uh, she actually took that uh, money, opened up a store. We started another family business. And uh, so I've been a businessman now for over a quarter century. Wow. So, uh, and, and again, you know, never look back, which is kind of what leads me uh, to where we are today. But, the, you know, fire department was fine. You know, you, you know what it's like. You see yeah. stuff that you, sh- that you shouldn't see. You sh- see stuff that you um, can't uh, easily forget. And, uh, you know, I, you know, how, was that re- how was that received back then, and how did that affect you and, and the firefighters around you, do you think, looking back? You know, in the early 90s, there really weren't that many programs. You know, it really was tough it out. Uh, you know, that's a long time ago, a uh, better part of 30 years now. I think even still, it's uh, very difficult for for people to bring it up, you know, a quarter century later. But uh, certainly at the certainly at the time, you know, it was all you know tough guy macho. In fact, I think it was the class before me where the first female uh, joined the service. So, huh. uh, you know, it was a different world, right? You know, uh, yeah. put it this way: it was before the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, just a different world. Uh, in many ways, that world still exists. Uh, you know, the difficulty. You know, there is certainly this you know human difficulty about talking about things that might be close to you. Um, but there's a, you know, the added uh, burden of, uh, you know, a largely macho, uh, environment, um, you know, and, and, and macho being defined, however, whoever defined is that way as being not talking about stuff and toughing it out. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, you know, I lost a couple of, uh, friends in high school to suicide. Right. Um, zero, zero support, zero programs, nothing, nothing in place at all back in those days. You know, and I'm talking very early eighties. Um, you know, whereas now there are at least programs, even though those programs don't have much uh, stickiness to them, uh, at least there is some, you know, some thought about uh, about helping people or giving them some tools or maybe even pointing them in the right direction. And I'll, I'll probably circle back to that story when we get uh, further along in the program. No, that's, and that's great. I, I welcome you to do so. In in reading your uh, the bio that you sent, Richard, and uh, you know, you outlined you've been through some some pretty significant family trauma. Um, and w- would you mind going through that a little bit? With me? Yeah, no, not, a, not at all. It's a, it's a good segue into what we were just talking about. So, um, you know, on a personal basis, when I was very young, you know, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, grade three, mm. uh, our family moved around a lot. Um, you know, and when I, by a lot, I don't mean you know, every few months, I mean, every few weeks. Oh, wow. So okay. it was, it was not, un, not uncommon to be in, in one town, you know, you know, be in a school and then a few weeks later leave. Uh, so, um, and living in a hotel, you know, for a few weeks at a time and then before moving on. So a bit of a transient, I guess, uh, lifestyle. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I certainly, for me, I know, um, you know, I was, uh, you know, obviously the oldest, but, um, for me, that was a very difficult thing. There was no sense of permanence. Um, you would, you know, you would, you would have the ability to just get to know people, to make friends as a young child, and then you'd be gone. Right. And you would, so you wouldn't invest much in terms of getting to know people because you knew you'd be leaving um, <laughs> in a few yeah. weeks' time. So, so I think that's a very difficult thing for me. 
uh, even still, I'll, I'll be honest, even still, you know, um, opening up to people, uh, not like it was, of course, but but just saying, you know, um, when are you going to be there? And, the, and, you know, these are things that you carry throughout your life and you learn to deal and cope with them. So I think for, for individuals, you know, and, and young children who who have a profound sense of uh, uncertainty, and there's certainly lots of uncertainty in life, but when you have that sort of uh, where are we going to be, uh, what does my next group of friends look like? You know, how do I learn to play hockey when I'm moving from hockey association to hockey association to hockey association? Right. Pretty difficult. Uh, you know, those, those things leave indelible marks on you. Um, but, but that really, that, those weren't the founding principles of where I am now, although they certainly contribute to it. Yeah, they certainly shaped uh, the, you. I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, you you can't uh, escape your genes, you can't ex- escape your upbringing, but you can certainly carve a new future up for yourself. And absolutely. I think that's a, that's an that's an important thing. You 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 aren't your past uh, entirely, and and uh, you know we all change um, through time. Uh, mm-hmm. But really, what what lands us to where we are today now in this is uh, again with three children, two boys and a girl. Um, you know, our kids are very busy in sports, you know, live in a pretty decent postal code, went to good schools, always very busy. Uh, we were very involved in their lives and, um, and very supportive. You know, I coached a lot. I coached all the kids in all the sports. I coached long before I had kids. I started coaching in, in high school. You were uh, probably but, hyper, uh, vigil- hyper vigilant to be involved, probably just because of what you had been through as when you were a kid. Yeah, certainly, certainly. I think that it, that was a contributing factor, and yeah. and then uh, you know, and in, in learning coaching in in my teens and coaching through my twenties, when I had kids, it just seemed kind of a natural. Actually, my my wife volunteered me one day without my knowledge, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and I thought, wow, I don't need to really coach my kids. It wasn't, and and even when I was coaching my kids, I was often coaching kids. Um, who were their peers who weren't even on their team. So I coach actually more kids without my uh, right. my children on those teams than than with them. But but notwithstanding that, uh, you know we're we're sailing through <clears throat> the teen years and the teen years are always uh, yeah. an interesting time. Yeah, they're fun. Um, yeah. yeah, and the, you know the oldest you know he gets through high school and you know, goes to university and then. And then the middle middle boy is, you know, uh, almost through high school, into grade 12, and, and going to go to uh, university. And my daughter's in grade 11. And uh, and unfortunately, and it's coming up actually very close to five years now, um, five-year anniversary, uh, she had a very good friend who uh, she was very concerned about for a few weeks, and we, we talked about it. Huh. And, uh, and uh, you know, into a weekend, couldn't get a hold of her. She wasn't responding. And uh, she came to me actually on the Friday and said, you know, Dad, I'm, I'm concerned. And, uh, you know, what should I do? I'm thinking of talking to the school. And I said, I'll tell you what, if she's not there at school, because she had been responding that she was sick and not feeling well. I said, if she's not at school, maybe, uh, maybe you should notify the school and get them to, to look at it. Uh, well, lo and behold, uh, that Monday morning, um, she discovered that her friend had committed suicide. Mm. Uh, that was her best friend and a uh, very difficult time. Uh, for my daughter because they did everything together. You know, they would go to school together. They would grab a coffee at Tim Hortons. They would arrive at school early, you know, talk about what girls talk about, yeah. uh, you know, go through their coursework, have their, their break together, uh, have lunch together. Uh, you know, after school, they would go to their, they were both athletes, so they would go to their respective practices, finish their practices, you know, go to um, Starbucks after that, come study often at our house, uh, and then spend a bit of an evening together and, you know, do whatever sports they were doing later that evening as well. So, um, hmm. the, the, the regimen and the tightness of that relationship, uh, vaporized overnight. Right. Um, and, uh, we all respond to those kinds of things. You know, the, the real, uh, the real, um, scope of tragedy is not only does it affect people, of course, but the amount of people it affects. So, um, the, you know, the research is showing that uh, every suicide directly affects 185 people. That's a that's a very wow. large number, um, yeah. and of course, it's going to affect those people in different ways. But in the case of our daughter, it profoundly affected her. So, um, you know, uh, you know, the school was very good. In fact, uh, you know, the principal of the school is personal friend, knew him very very well. He said, you know, we're we're having some difficulties, of course, as as everyone was. 
and the counselors show up, etc., and they, they say, you know, this is difficult, watch out for this, watch out for that. So, of course, I'm sleeping with one eye open right. uh, after that situation. You don't want to be creeping, <laughs> you, you know, your yeah. child. You want to be staying in touch, and they have to kind of find their own way of dealing with it and, you know, in their own group, which they were doing. And, you know, always checking in, of course, doing the prudent thing. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, they said, you know, sort of 14 to 16 days uh, later is a very difficult time after a couple of weeks. Um, you know, just, you know, watch out for some signs. Well, as it turned out, uh, our daughter uh, attempted as well two weeks after that. And uh, mm. she took a, an overdose of uh, my wife's sleeping pills mm. um and of course we're at the children's hospital uh, till 5 30 in the morning that night fortunately our oldest boy uh was up late and and she had kind of called out to him and said you better get mom and dad uh after she had done it the interesting thing is um she it, it wouldn't have been successful those sleeping pills would not have killed her but she didn't know that she didn't know so, that right right so so the attempt was uh was real and uh, and that certainly um, changed things for us. So um, it became a question of uh, not removing her from the high school where she had other friends, of course, and uh, her brothers had gone there. It's reasonably close to the house, community-based school. And uh, so, you know, I just said, look, at, you know, we don't want to take you from the school. Let's just get you through high school. <laughs> you know, we don't really care. Just pass. Uh, move through high school and then on the other side to, you know getting out of the physical environment you know the reminder of seeing the empty locker and and that whole regimen being disrupted right um just just move through and then you know there's there's something on the other side of high school high school is not life and uh and there you got many more years ahead of you so so we did that um yeah. my daughter's very uh vibrant girl uh very intelligent girl and uh, but, you know, she she was a little bit uh, um, waylaid in school. And so she didn't uh, put as much attention in the school as as she would have. Right. You know, her marks were marginal. Um, uh, she did do a French degree, which was great, of course, because it was a bilingual school. Yeah. And then uh, and then after uh, after school, she she nannied. She worked. She works very hard. She still works very hard. Uh, she works for the Calgary Flames uh, NHL team. Oh, she works cool. for the Calgary Stampeders football team. Um, she's a go-getter. She's very entrepreneurial. She's the most entrepreneurial of our kids. So uh, we have uh, great hopes. Uh, we have great hopes for all our kids, of course, but she's particularly skilled on the entrepreneurial side. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and so she spent, you know, three years, uh, you know, um, dealing with it, being very busy. Uh, she's a great nanny. She's nannied to a couple of young children, many more than that, but two in particular, okay. um, which she's grown very, very uh, close with and very close to the family. Um, and, and the, you know, the great news is she finally said, uh, and we were waiting for the signal from her. We weren't pushing her too hard. Right. Um, and we were, she finally said, you know, I think I want to go to university now. <laughs> we said, okay, great. And, uh, and as it turns out, um, she didn't have the marks to do nursing. She's a very nursy girl. Right. Um, but, but her science background is not strong enough to do nursing. And, and rather than go back and, and do upgrading, uh, what she's elected to do is actually do a public health degree at the University of Lethbridge. So she's, she's in Lethbridge, which is two and a half hours away. It's still away. She's in residence, but it's close enough. And, um, and, uh, her first semester was very good. Her marks were superb. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and she sort of gained the confidence to leave the nest and, 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 uh, take it to the next step of, of her life. So it's, but it was, uh, you know, really three years of re rebuilding with her of, of, yeah. you know, teaching her how to cope with it and, and it threw a curveball into her system and, uh, deeply impacted her. And, um, and, you know, I guess the good news is she has now skills that she's honed. Um, that have made her a stronger person and helped her cope with, uh, you know, trauma. And uh, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Richard, all this is happening, and, you know, how are you, how are you coping through this? What things are you doing through all this to make sure that, to make sure that you're okay and, you know, for you, for you and your wife? Yeah, these and these are the, that's those are very good questions for for both of us and and my wife and I um, deal with it in different ways for a number of reasons. My my wife has also experienced great childhood trauma, okay. um, and uh, so we both come from uh, let's just say dark alleys. <laughs> yeah. So we we know what dark alleys look like. Right. Um, both uh, you know in my case. 
personally and professionally. Um, and in her case, you know, working in corrections, uh, both in Manitoba and here uh, as a correctional officer, uh, those were di- very difficult things. I remember times when she would have uh, uh, instantial breakouts of hives because of the stress of going to work. Really? Uh, she was, yeah, she was working at Headingley Jail and uh, and and uh, was so um, overwhelmed at times with it that you know it would manifest physically with the, this, this this hive breakout. So that's telling you something, right? It's telling yeah. you your 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 mind and body are telling you something. With regards to reporting for duty, and 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 that's one of the reasons uh, we left Manitoba. Not the only reason. We she always wanted to come back to Calgary, but um, yeah. and when she landed the job here, she did leave Henley on very good terms. But you know that's a much different uh, environment than the Remand Center, for instance. But uh, but both of us deal with it in different ways. Um, you know, based on our background, and but also based on on gender, right? So uh, you know, she, a female with a daughter, has a different. A uh, set of dynamics than I do as a father with right. a daughter, right. and and so those are always uh, and and those are always very unpredictable. Um, you know what we've always tried to do is you know remain together with regards uh, to to our daughter, and so have the boys. So she's very close with both of her brothers, uh, who are superb resources. So so I think the way of coping with it is uh, is the team model, right? Where we're all in. Yeah. So all four of all four of us are resources, and if if she needs to talk to one and does not want to talk to another at uh, a period of time. She's got four people to talk with uh, in the immediate family, as well as, of course, aunts and uncles and that who've been, who've been very good, some of those uh, still out in eastern Canada. Uh, so part of our, you know, if you will, our therapy was to send her back to Newfoundland to spend time with my family. And the other part of the therapy was she had an opportunity to go over to uh, Europe with uh, with another friend that she made uh, from Germany who came here in field hockey because she's a field hockey player. Okay. And uh, and so she spent three weeks in Europe, which was a really great um, you know kind of decompression time, right? So right. for her that was a it was a great trip. She got to see a bunch of the world, meet new friends over there. Um, and in fact, in her degree, it's likely that uh, that uh, Europe is certainly an opportunity because it's a practicum base, and so they spend a semester or two their choice. Um, outside of uh, outside of the school, learning wherever they want to go, and including abroad. So we're quite excited about that. And uh, and you know, in terms of how we deal with it, it's uh, we're dealing with it. You know, we don't want to creep. We check in. Um, we're always there. You know, reaching out for support uh, without being overwhelming. Um, and you can call any time. So uh, you know, my wife has gone down a couple of times to Lethbridge just in terms of support, hang out, you know, do what mothers and daughters do. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not you know, it's not atypical. Um, but I will say that uh, unfortunately, um, uh, four days ago now, uh, her best friend uh, who lives in Calgary, going to University of Calgary, um, uh, the, uh, his roommate. And and one of his best buddies actually committed suicide four days ago. Oh, uh, and that uh, our, our daughter got a hold of us right away and said, "This is what happened." And uh, and so actually after this podcast, uh, we're heading down to Lethbridge to go see her, take her out for lunch, uh, spend a little bit of time with her. She's very excited about that. Uh, but of course, she's got a lot of school work, so she's going to kick us to the curb, and we're going to you know hang out in downtown Lethbridge and then come back to Calgary yeah. to give her time to 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 school. But uh, like how is this? How is that affecting you, Richard? Because this is. Are you having a feeling like? Oh, well, back like, of mind for sure. Yeah, like you know, here, here we go. Yeah. Like here we go. Yeah, here we go again. Yeah. Um, and and you, and you 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 don't necessarily need to jump to that conclusion. No. You can't help yourself. You can't, you can't help, help yourself yeah. from jumping to that conclusion. Right. Um. Uh, but she did do a reach out and and yeah, that's and awesome. she is a that's much, perfect. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. And she's a much different girl. Uh, you know, again, with her own capacity, building her own capacity, her own skills uh, over the last five years. But but but, the, you know, the you know, the thing that's in the back of our mind with all four of us yeah. is that, uh, you know, it's coming up on the five year anniversary. And and we all know that the five year anniversary is a tough time for her. In fact, she identified it a couple of weeks ago. Right. right. It's coming up on five years. So okay. you always have this in the back of your mind. Yeah. Um, and, and it's inescapable. You don't want to hit the panic button and we're not hitting the panic button. 
but well, we're just saying we're there in terms of support. Anything you know that's needed, you know, we're going to bring a few clothes down and a bit of food and you know whatever else you yeah. want. We're going to bring the dog, yeah. right? We're, uh, we got a dog and two cats. We're going to bring the dog with us and uh, hang out for a bit, and, and you know, to the extent she's comfortable and her time yeah. allows it, right? Without compromising her academics, and then. Uh, and then we'll just, uh, you know, we'll just come back. And, but, it, you know, it's nice that it's two and a half hours away, right? So it's right. not, uh, it's not too difficult to get to. If, if, if she was in Eastern Canada, that would be a, you know, a yeah. different challenge. Well, certainly, um, but also, certainly but also I have family back there, right? If, uh, in the case of our brother and, uh, and one of those family members is a paramedic. Okay. Not, not far, right? Uh, you yeah. might even know him. Um, but anyways, uh, and he worked with, with, uh, with Pete Tripp. Um, so, oh, really? so, you know, yeah, the extended family, um, you know, is another, uh, another resource and, and, and they've been very, very good even in Eastern Canada in terms of support and likewise us to them. So, uh, you know, we all go through stuff, right? So you can't have an, yeah. I don't think, I don't think that your support network can be too big. No, absolutely. And please, you know, when you see your daughter say hello, pass my condolences, um, certainly. And, uh. We want no, I appreciate okay. that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah, very kind of you to say that. And uh, and she's been very open. You know, she and I have talked. You know, because this uh, this really was the premeditating factor in terms of of do and and uh, and e mental health. And so uh, you know, I always uh, talk to my daughter. I didn't want to bring up any specifics. And I said, you know, I'm not going to say anything if you don't want me to. And she's been very open about it. Yeah. Um, because uh, I, I think she understands. Uh, the importance of telling these stories, and uh, not just for others, but for herself. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, definitely thank her for that. And that. That brings us right into it perfectly. So the Do Mental Health app, talk to me about it. What led you to want to do it? Let's get into that. So um, so the really the, the founding principle on Do uh, was exactly her story. So, so you know, here we are really quite plugged into the school, Plugged into the leadership of the school, and and I'm not, I'm not um, in any way denigrating the school for what they did, but schools are very good at crisis response. Right. So when something goes down, you know the you know uh, the metaphor is a Navy SEAL show up, the counselors show up, all of the resources get activated, and uh, and for good reason, you know, yeah. to to deal with grief and and the counseling side of it, but also to uh, also to make sure that, uh, you know, it isn't infectious. And in the case of my daughter and actually two other individuals in a group of nine also tried. She wasn't the only one. Hmm. Um, and all around the same period. So three out of nine of a tight knit group attempted after. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that tells you, right? So, so I understand the, the, the crisis response. I totally get that it's necessary. But, but after that settled down, once that, you know, once those things have been done, we were on our own. Right. So two weeks later, when it happens, we're on our own. And and I and I said, well, you know, if, if this is the norm and it likely is uh, that a couple of weeks later, there's a there's a risk period, uh, a post traumatic rest risk period where there's a, a higher propensity of individuals to to, um, you know, go further. Um, then uh, then why aren't we able to understand that and do something about it other than. Us having the, that risk factor and going to the hospital and maybe the outcome could have been worse. So, so to me, it seems that, um, that there's something missing. And, and so I said, we've got to be able to do something surely in, in, in the, in today's age of technology, we've got to be able to do something. And so, uh, it wasn't that do as it's currently, um, conceived was fully conceived at the time. I, I didn't have a fully baked product, but what I, what I did say to myself is, Got to find a better way, and so, so a few years after that, you know, when I created my startup, one of the areas, and it's not just a mental health, but one of the areas that, that I looked at was mental health, and I actually wandered into that space, uh, but was because of our work in cancer. So we have a, a sister product called Lab Coat, which is not, you know, specifically designed for cancer, but it's designed to enable what we call agile research for researchers to very quickly find out what works and doesn't um, and get and get feedback from from patients as well as from other data sources to determine that and, and you know it could work in clinical trials with pharma companies etc cetera, etc cetera. but but the other part of that is what we call adaptive clinical care and smart follow-up so so you know you go see your doc and you know I don't know you have high blood pressure whatever and your doc says okay I want to I'm going to put you on this 
this medication. I want you to walk, you know, uh, 10K a day, not four. And I want you to reduce your, you know, uh, the baked goods you eat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and, uh, and then you say, okay, great. And, and your doc relies on the fact that, you know, unless something goes really sideways, things are going good. It might come back and say, you know, uh, I want to see you in a month. Let's, you know, you know, track your blood pressure every once in a while, whatever, and, you know, monitor your steps. Well, we have, you know, Fitbits and Apple Watches and phones and stuff that can do all of that. So, yeah. so we're gathering a lot of data, but the problem is that data is not being uh, aggregated. So, so you know, the concept of, of lab coat was was built for cancer, in particular prostate cancer at the time, but it's certainly more much larger than that. And mm-hmm. and and the real the real issue with cancer is cancer is a very difficult thing. Um, but what makes cancer <clears throat> particularly difficult, and it's not just limited to cancer, is the mental health issues. That it brings, so it breeds fear and high anxiety, and it brings out in people this this constant worry, much like uh, post suicide, right? So where you're right. you're sleeping with one open, and even if you beat it, even if you beat it, uh, you don't really beat it, right? Because you're always wondering if it's going to come back. So so yeah. the journey of cancer recovery, the vast majority of cancer recovery journey is is in mental health, and uh, and even if you were to beat it, it was to go into remission, and you were to say. And, you know, uh, at the moment, I'm cancer free, you know, which is kind of a bad choice of words, but because uh, it could very well come back. And so that's always the kind of that fear. And so so these are very strong emotions that aren't easily resolvable. And it was on the mental health side of, of cancer that that the basics of, of do were created. We actually created a product called Marbles. That was going to be the name of it, the code name first. We we were going to call it marbles, right? As in, try to keep yours. Yeah, <laughs> and, absolutely. Uh, and and then you know I'm, a, I'm you know I remember the days of uh, the dew line in northern Canada, and so before the the missiles uh, showed up, you know the only way to deliver a nuclear warhead was by bombers, and of course right. North America was concerned that the the Ruskies were going to come over the top of the pole, right? Right. And so they so they built this very elaborate infrastructure called the dew line. Uh, for distant early warning and and mm. and the whole purpose of our product is to provide ways for warning so right. for early warning so that um, because we're we're very good as a society in mental health of responding uh, to a crisis right much like a you know a school shooting for instance or or whatever so when that happens you know the the team show up but but we're really lousy at prevention and 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 yeah. even insofar as the bulk of the capital, i.e., the money, is put into intervention versus prevention. Right. And so, with mental health, as as you well know, and I well know, and many of the listeners will know well, that is, if you get far enough, enough along with it, it's a much harder dragon to slay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah. and 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 even further than that is, you know, and we might have trigger events, right? Things that occur. And, and, and you know, in the line of duty as a paramedic, you might encounter something, and it just it triggers something that you you may be perhaps even repressed, or you put off on the side, or something from your own childhood, right. um, and, and 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 which causes a downward spiral for you that for which you may never recover. You know, if we witness the Yonkville uh, shooting in in California, right, right with the with the um, the the military, the former military fella who was in a program with PTSD, and that didn't work, mm-hmm. so. So it's not that, you know, you know, if you go overseas and you're doing service in the military, you're likely going to see some stuff and uh, you come back a different person as as he did. And, and your PTSD perhaps doesn't get resolved. Um, and, 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 and we can't escape that. Right. You, you, you right. went over, you served, you saw stuff, you have PTSD. Um, but but in the case of of those, the vast majority of people don't need clinical interventions in mental health. This is this is what's really quite puzzling to me. Okay. So if we even looked at suicidal ideation, if we even looked at people who were seriously contemplating suicide, only 5% of those individuals actually need a clinical intervention, which means 95% of them just need to talk to somebody who says the right thing at the right time. And right. and that need not even be a professional. So, so we have a, ma- a vast amount of resources put into intervening in a in a crisis situation, um, when the vast majority of resources should be put into creating capacity, etc., helping people build skills, openly talking about this sort of stuff, you know, um, yeah. you know, in schools, in high schools, it's remarkable how many suicides there are, as well as in universities. And universities are more challenging, but in high schools, this should be part of the health program. Absolutely. 
Yeah. The, you know, why not? And, and here's the real interesting thing about um, children and adolescents. You know, we often view them as being, you know, these, uh, these soft individuals. They tend to be more resilient than we expect. And, and we should perhaps be having conversations with them and building skills in them to deal with the difficulties that they're going to face in life. Because the truth is life's going to kick the hell out of all of us, whether we want it to or not. We're going to encounter things. Things are going to show up at our doorstep, much like they did with us. And we didn't invite this in. It came in. Yeah. And, uh, and it's very tragic for the family, of course, very tragic for our family and others. Um, but we, we have to deal with it. And so building those kinds of skills, um, you know, the institutions uh, aren't doing it. And, and being the entrepreneur that I am, I, I usually don't ask for permission. I don't yeah. usually w- I don't usually wait for the glacial like pace of large institutions to do this, and so uh, you know uh, with the skills that that we have as a team, we we built a platform, uh, not an app. You know, when people say it's an app. The app is really maybe ten percent at right. the most okay. of what we offer, yeah. um, and so 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 we, now we have these ubiquitous devices called smartphones. You know, yeah. and most people in the Western world have them. Young kids even have them, and uh, and I'll share another story. So. Um, just over a year ago, uh, you know, I lived near Foothills Hospital in Calgary, and uh, you know, after midnight, I can't remember the exact time, uh, two Januarys ago, um, you know, a fellow uh, had parked outside the emergency department, you know, on the uh, approach ramps for for the ambulance, and right. and sat there and and had a gun in the car and and ended his life, oh. and 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 you think, you know, and I don't know the specifics of the story, uh, but but imagine, you know, you you drive. You drive to the emergency department, which is really meaning that you you want to get help. I mean, he could have gone anywhere, right, to, to do that, but he went to the emergency department, and um, and and the courage. I'm I'm sure it takes a lot of courage to to pull a gun on yourself, mm-hmm. um, but it it took more courage to walk through the doors, and he was 50 feet from the doors, and and he elected not to do that. So. That was a very, very uh, compelling story for me to say, you know, we we just say p- people rather casually, oh, just go out and seek some help. What if you can't? What if seeking help requires more courage than pulling a trigger? Um, and yeah. so can can we, instead of, you know, the, the requirement being on the individual going through difficulty, and if the individual is going to, through difficulty, it's even harder to pick up the phone, right, to make a call to the, the, the crisis line or to walk through the emergency doors, or even go talk to your doctor, or bring it up with your spouse. You know, these are these are the great difficulties. And so, um, is, it, is it not possible for us to reach out to individuals? If there are things they're doing, are there ways for us to understand that, you know what, they're in the red zone right now? And they may not even know they're in the red zone. That's the interesting thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, we don't have data on this stuff. So, we, we, we may know what suicide rates are. We may know what mental health rates are for depression or anxiety or PTSD, you know, what we call incidents. But, but it doesn't mean we know much about them and we know very little about them. And, uh, and, and the other thing that, uh, that do enables is it allows us to change the narrative around it. So, not only can, you know, I be on my smartphone and may, maybe, let's just say I'm clinically, um, diagnosed with PTSD. Okay. Um, um, you know, I could create a, a PTSD questionnaire on my phone, which is what I would do um, on paper with a professional right. uh, or on my own. Uh, so why can't we just leverage a smartphone to do that? Yeah, and the absolutely. smartphone can score that, right? A smartphone can score that instantly. So I don't need yeah. to burden the resources. I don't need to sit down with a nurse, for instance. And, and of course, I'm going to answer those questions in the presence of a nurse differently than I will Without the nurse, that's that's a that's a given. That's the Heisenberg principle. So, so for sure, it you know why can't I do that in the comfort of my home? Home, yeah. And why am I limited to only doing that when I go see a nurse every two weeks or every month or whatever, right? Which means the vast majority of the data isn't captured because we could capture data faster, get better data more frequently if we if we brought these tools onto phones. And and it's not that we want to burden people on phones. But if they complete that, and there is, for instance, a trigger question, so if they answer four to four on a particular question, yeah, that that is indicative of something going on. Their their overall mark on that score might be good, might be okay, might be kind of you know yellow, not green, not red. But right. because they answer one or two questions in a particular fashion, that is significant. And and so that but what that could do is it could, could communicate back to the team, so that individual could share with their 
GP could share with their counselor, could share with their minister, or if you trust with them that, you know, here's kind of how I'm doing. And now there's a, you know, a beep, beep, beep going on, which is, hmm, something's happening. Yeah. And, I mean, so, and we don't need it to go so far. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I downloaded the app last week. So obviously just because I wanted to have a look at it before I talk to you. But so I'm in it, and basically, and this is just so from a user point of view, here's what I see. So there's a, a series of questionnaires or check-ins. So you have your generalized anxiety, insomnia, mood disorders, PTSD, pain, and quality of life. So you go through all these little questions. And they're, not, they're not hard to answer, but they do require you to do something which we generally don't do, and that is check in with ourselves. So, right. And, and I know I'm, you know, I am horrible for that. So you go through each one of those, and when you're done, you get a score, and then so you can sort of see how you're doing. But then at the bottom, it also says see suggested actions. So, you know, if you have a certain score and you'd like to some tips to to get that score better or <laughs> or make yourself better, there you, there are some suggestions for that. Um, you know, which is great. So for me as a user, Richard, how often, if I want to get the most out of this, how often should I be checking in? Yeah, and that's a very difficult question to answer because the, the check-ins you would do now, and, you know, if you were, you know, if you were admitted, for instance, to an ER, you would probably do those check-ins on a daily basis or maybe even more, more than once a day. Right. But, but in terms of self-check-ins, it's really up to the individual to um, to do it. Now, if you were to look at those questionnaires, and it isn't the case that an individual needs to complete all of them. Right. But here's but but there's a couple of things. Um, so I will answer your question in two ways. So the okay. first thing is, even for people who are diagnosed, um, 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 most people who aren't diagnosed. So we have people with PTSD who are, have not been diagnosed with PTSD. I think there's far more the, who aren't diagnosed oh, than are. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're bang on. Yeah. And and the the trick about that is they've never been screened. Right. Right. So so I could so I could be sitting home here in Calgary and I could I could pull up that app and go you know what, or it could ask me. Would you like to screen for anxiety? You know what? I've never been screened for anxiety. Let me complete it. Well, lo and behold, actually, I have anxiety. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, maybe I should talk to somebody about my anxiety. I might just have anxiety that day. You know what? I'll do it again tomorrow or yeah. in a couple of days or in a week. And if you look at those instruments, we've deliberately chosen those instruments for two reasons. One is they're a screening questionnaire, so it allows an individual who's never been screened for PTSD to screen and go, hey, hang on a second here. I'm, I'm, I'm higher than I thought, or you know what? I'm nothing. And, and they could screen that again if there was something that said maybe you should talk to somebody about it. They could go a couple more days and do it. But the, the actual frequency of those questionnaires is every two weeks. So, so it asks you in the last two weeks, which, which means you don't have to remember too far into the past, right? So, right. so really the, the, the good frequency would be to do it every two weeks, a c- couple of times a month. And, and that gives you enough data without it being burdensome to you. You can certainly elect to do it more more frequently than that, right. but you don't have to do it necessarily daily, you know, unless unless there's really something going on, uh, or or your physician said, for instance, if you talk to or a psychologist said, maybe you should do that every day. Let's just see how you're going to do over the next few weeks. And 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 what's interesting about that is, not only do we have um, you know, these, these sort of environmental factors with regards to our work and our family life and our community life, etc. But we, we often as human beings, we fail to appreciate the great environment and its effect on us. Right. So, so combined with that technology is the ability to track your symptoms, if you will, or your condition right. against ambient data, environmental data. So that could be hours of sunshine. That could be time of day. That could be day of week. That could be the amount of steps you've taken, for instance. So around us in the environment, there are things that absolutely affect us psychologically. Um, so for me, you know, as I get older and crankier, um, <laughs> winters become more difficult. Now, unlike as a child when I was outside playing hockey or whatever all the time, right, and getting a reasonable amount of sunshine, um, as I'm older now, it's much harder to get the sunshine. And so, uh, you know, it, it, you know, certainly my physician said, you know, it's, it, you could have SAD, uh, not uncommon. 
And uh, so I have sitting 18 inches from my face at this moment a phototherapy lamp, right? Because right. I'm not getting enough vitamin D. You can only – so my body needs to say, well, there's more sunshine. Um, and so that's a, that's a difficult thing. So so perhaps my cycle of when I get up, I have rougher parts of my day than other. Maybe the, maybe noon is, is difficult. Maybe Wednesdays are hump day and are difficult. Maybe it's Mondays. And we all have our own cycles. We all have our own – signatures or figure, fingerprints just like we have our own dna and it's a, you know it's the social determinants of health and the environmental determinants of health that are much more uh contributory to conditions than just genetics right so yeah, it, yeah. right and and, and 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 this is really interesting not just with, with regards to ptsd or anxiety or whatever we we are really absent data on this and so yeah, the purpose sure. of so the purpose of the app is for you and, and I like how you how you term this, which is I'm checking in with myself, right? Which yeah. is really a great way to look at it, because at the end of the day, the responsibility for doing this lands with all of us, including our support group. So so if you have some trauma related to a job or whatever the case may be, um, what's interesting is you're going to find support for that in places that may not involve your workplace. And you you should you shouldn't be limited, for instance, to just the workplace, right? Which means maybe there are programs. You know, some workplaces are better than others, and and maybe you have to go far to to activate those. So you need to be on short-term disability, for instance, in order to qualify for for it. Right. Um, yet you don't. Why do you need to be on short-term disability? And and maybe you just have a bit. Maybe there's parts of the seasons that are difficult for you. Uh, maybe there are you know days of the week that are more difficult than others, or times of day that are more difficult. We all experience that, right? Yes. Um, and so, so what we what we now have is the ability through technology to actually grab that data. So, mm. so we may now be able to correlate. You know, it, it would surprise no one um, that, for instance, you know, in Vancouver, that the rates of suicide are higher in the winter than they are in the summer. Right. It's not that's not a big revelation for me to say that, but. But what's interesting is why? Well, we know that the winters are tougher from a weather perspective. It rains, it's overcast, it's darker, it's drearier, of course. Yeah. Um, but does it affect all people equally? Probably not. Are certain people more prone to it than others? Likely. Mm-hmm. But we don't, you know, here we are decades later, but we haven't, we, we haven't, um, you know, um, I guess investigated that enough. Yeah. You know, and so it might be there, there are people who are more predisposed, and what is it about those individuals? Uh, that we could target programs around this, right? We could target to say, we're going to do these things for these people. We're going to do different things for different people because there are different groups of people. Much like in cancer, we do certain things for certain types of cancers right. and certain things for others. And so we have what we call precision medicine or personal medicine. And, and mental health is the same way that, you know, we could pick a hundred people who have PTSD and we might have a hundred different ways to treat the PTSD. It's not a one size. Fits no, all. that's that's right. Now, these uh, Richard, these questionnaires that you go through, how were these built? Like, where did you get these questionnaires from? So they're all con- they're all conventional questionnaires. Uh, we we ask for them to have um, medical validation. Right. We ask we ask for them to be um, in in the marketplace, if you will, for uh, a period of time. Many of them are twenty five and thirty years old. Okay. So right. so a GAD a GAD seven it would be a conventional anxiety question that you would do if you were being screened for anxiety with a physician or somebody else. Okay. Um, uh, PHQ nine is a depression. What's called a mood questionnaire. It's a short form. Right. We also wanted to be short form. So the the purpose is not. Um, there, so if we, if we, if we had clinical on the left and research on the far right uh, as a spectrum, the far right for research would want 100 or 150 questions. <laughs> they would ask right. you a battery of questions to see what yeah. worked. And, and on the clinical, you'd say, well, I really only want one. If there's one magic question that I could ask and that could tell me, that's great, right? Because you're very constrained for time. Right. Um, so, so if you're, we're going to be doing on, on a phone, we don't want people to sit, to have to sit down for a hundred questions. Now, if they're in active care, that's a different story. We certainly could activate longer questionnaires. Easy to do for an individual who's having a tough go, right? Who may right. be, you know, they're maybe not, uh, they, they've been in the ER or they've been checked into a, you know, a psychiatric facility for a period of time. They've been discharged and then there's a, a very active follow-up period once they're back out. Um, that could certainly be supported. But again, most people have never been screened for these kinds of things. And most people are in clinical. So if we look at a pyramid of, of, of mental 
health right. for the population. It doesn't matter what that population is. The, 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 you know, the general terms is about 11% are uh, need clinical support. Okay, and and that number is actually even a little bit high, but we're going to go with that number of 11 percent. It's likely closer to three to five, um, but and, and part of that challenge is we tend to over medicalize these things, right? right. And when it when it does happen, and it doesn't mean people uh, don't need help, but again, we're we're pri- privileging um, crisis intervention over prevention, and so the vast majority, oh, somebody, you know, nobody wants the guilt of we didn't do something for people, even though. Quite often that fails, so that tells right. us something, right? So, so and and despite all of the the money and and all of the and in particular pharma development that have gone into this, we have not moved the needle with regards to mental health in decades. There's been no change, so we must be doing something wrong, okay? Mm-hmm. But but let's just assume that we have 11 percent of the population in need of clinical support. Below that. In the pyramid, uh, and 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 I'm going to use, and I don't mean this pejorative, pejoratively, um, and and this is sort of the inheritance of of the mental health model going back to Freud, which is a pathological model, right? Which is which is there's something wrong with you. So, right. and I'm not supporting this model, but I'm just using it for the pur- purposes of communication. But I'm not trying to dismiss that there are people with mental health issues that are very very serious, right. and they need a, a daily injectable, right? They may need a, a lithium treatment every single day in order to stay kind of on the straight. Right. Um, but uh, but below that, uh, we might call those people clinical or, or let's just, you know, we would call them um, unhealthy perhaps. They, they really need to resolve these issues with support, with clinical support in order to be put into a healthy state. Okay, right. good. Below that, we would have less healthy people. So that represents approximately 25% of the population. So a quarter of the population is not in the clinical space, but they're not – healthy, fully functioning. There's something going on. Uh, they may have PTSD and be kind of, you know, fighting a good fight and, 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 and figuring out how to do it, but they don't need drugs and they don't need extensive periods of counseling, etc. and they work it out. And that's the truth of it, right? Because we all have our own resilience. We all build our own skills. They may have good family support and peer support, etc. Yeah. And they're, and they're going through and doing okay. Okay. But they may have instantial periods of time where they do have to go in for an oil change. They may have a bad day or a bad week or a bad month yeah. or a bad a bad quarter of a year, right? That's a bad right. winter. Yeah. Um, and 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 so so they're not high 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 functioning and ultra healthy, but they're not clinical either. They're kind of in that you know that no man's land in yeah. between or a liminal stage. And then we have below that the two thirds of the population that's humming along just fine, that are healthy, right? right. They're doing great, but. What's interesting is that how do the you know the the eleven percent get fed? Well, you know the the farm team, if you will, for the clinical are the people who are less healthy, who who get something and it triggers something so that not only are they they're kind of doing okay, but something happens and all of a sudden now they need a clinical intervention. Now they need a a drug pe- treatment maybe for a few weeks at a time. Now they do need some counseling, some much more intense counseling and a much more intense follow up. Um, or it could be the case that you're in the healthy population and something happens. Right. There's a tragic death in the family, you know, car accident or something, and you're and you're doing just everything is great. Nothing's going to shatter your world, or so you believe. And now, now you you need meds, right? So, so in the case of suicide, it's often the case that people need meds. And, you know, the interesting thing about caregivers is most caregivers are unpaid, three quarters or more are unpaid, yeah. and and they're likely loved ones. It could be a spouse or a a son or a parent or whatever, right? right? Who's who's doing this yeoman work, and what's the effect on them? Right. Yeah. There's a massive effect. And, 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 and often, you know, you know, you know, and I shared this story with you last night. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a PTSD breeding PTSD in caregivers. Yeah. And, and uh, oh, so, you know, so now you have this compound effect. Right. So so I, I'm good. Right. I'm good. And all of a sudden something goes sideways. And then next thing you know, I've got PTSD, too. And, and so the you know, the, this you know, if this was a virus. It would be an, an infection rate, and boy, you, the Navy SEALs would show up. Yeah, but because right. it's mental, mental health, it's kind of you know these are accepted casualties. <laughs> you're right. right? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what we're working to change. Because you're right. That is exactly. Insane. I mean, so how has this? Have you have any numbers? First of all, like how many people are are using this app? If you have those numbers, and and how has it been received? What kind of feedback have you received back from it? 
Yeah, so so we originally so do 1.0, which is the version you have, right. uh, was our first foray into the marketplace with it. And and in in do point 1.0, um, what we were doing is we were bringing this medically validated, more clinical approach to it. Um, and we're very pleased with do 1.0. But if I looked at it from a market perspective, I'd be saying, well, that only represents one percent of the market, and that one percent of the market are people who tend to be uh, experiencing a clinical intervention. So so we don't really want to provide a tool exclusively for those individuals. And it's not like we're we're ignoring those individuals, but we have 90% of the market, which isn't clinical. And right. so it doesn't make sense to be providing tools to people who already have tools and support. What we need to do is, is get the 25% of the population who's in the less healthy group and even the three-quarters or the two-thirds of the population who are in the healthy Group. Yeah. Because in order to, if, if, and we're all about prevention. So if we're going to prevent, we need to give, we need, if, you know, if I was a physician, I'd want a baseline. How were you before something happened? How yeah. were you after? We're going to intervene. We're going to, we're going to treat you in some way, for instance. And how are you after that? And is that treatment even working? Can we get you back to your old baseline or as close to your old baseline as possible? So for those individuals who aren't clinical, it doesn't make sense for them to, on a daily basis or even on a biweekly basis, you know, complete a, you know, a PTSD questionnaire, which is, you know, over 20 questions, so it's fairly lengthy, right. and there's no short form version of that, right. unfortunately. Um, so, so why do we want to burden those individuals with doing so? And, and what if somebody could just complete this every two weeks or once a month or whatever, and use it as both a screening and a monitoring tool? But they're otherwise very, very good, and so. So we want to get data on as many people as possible. So do 2.0 is actually in the works. Uh, we should have a beta of that product at the end of March now. Okay. And what we're, what we're really excited about 2.0 is it's more designed for everyone. Okay. So it, it will still include, and we're recommending quarterly, that you could go in and it, we're gaming it a little bit so that you could say, I'm going to do a screen for depression once a quarter over the year. I could do it more often than that if I want. Right. And what, what's interesting about that is now it'll get your depression score by every season of the year. Right. So you'll that's right. Yeah. That is important. Yes, but it doesn't mean I couldn't routinely do it from time to time. And we're actually breaking the questionnaire up. The researchers will go crazy, but this isn't about research. This is about getting data uh, with groups that don't even have data, and we can further interrogate it through other research as time goes on. But let's just t- let's take the people at the bottom of the pyramid. The people who are healthy. What data do we have on healthy people about what they're doing that's healthy, that allows them to combat depression, for instance? Or if they if they have depression, it's not debilitating. Right. There's no data on that anywhere in the world. And so so what? And then and there's another part of that that I were, want to relate to. So the first thing is we want to make it easy. So it might ask you just one, two, or even three questions. A day, and it's a me tab, so it's about me, and that's the other thing that's important. I'm not doing this data so that I can share it with my clinician. I'm doing this data, as you said, to check in with myself right. in an even less burdensome manner to make it fun. And then to your point about the suggested actions, what we're doing is we're actually uh, uh, putting um, some machine learning on this. So the more data we get, the more we're going to be able to mine that data and say, here's what's working for others. So let's just imagine we had... I don't know, a thousand people with PTSD using the um, the app. The app puts that data into our own engine, and it's fully anonymized. No one will ever know that that would be you or me using it. We cloak all of that data. In fact, our staff can't even see what's in the database. It's scrambled completely. So, But what we can do is we can put some new technologies on that and mine it to say, you know what? There, these people are finding these things to be very effective. Their scores, and they're not even reporting it. Their scores are reporting it. Right. It's that interesting, right? So it's not somebody consciously saying, "Hey, this worked for me." And this is the great. I think this is the double-edged sword about mental health, which is we get comparative. Oh, oh yeah, my friend had PTSD. It was really, really bad. You know, you know yeah. what I mean? I just I put a video. Loaded. I just put a video on that. <laughs> That exact yeah. thing. There, there are no. Listen, you're not getting a medal. There's no Olympics for for trauma. Exactly. Like, stop it. You just need to stop. Yeah. We need, we need exactly. to support people and stop competing with people. A hundred percent. And yeah. what's interesting now is we can have machines. We can have technology support people. And here's the real truth, is and particularly for younger people, but certainly for people 
uh, who are older is, you know, there's still a lot of stigma, there's embarrassment and, and, and there's guilt and shame right. attached to these things. And if, and if I can learn from others who I don't even know, and it doesn't mean we don't want peer support because we do and we want to be able to support that, but even if peer support, we're not pulling data. So if we could pull data for people who are getting peer support, I have PTSD, I'm counseling you, helping you, we go for coffee once a week, much like AA, right? So I've got my sponsor, I've got someone who's been to Afghanistan, they know what it's like, they know the dark alleys, they can see in me things that I don't even see myself. Right. We don't even have data on that, right? And, and, and could it be the case that there's data that says, you know what, these are the top three things you should try. And you might need to try them in combination, yeah. um, not just one thing, right? Because... Yeah. It's much like HIV AIDS, right? So, and, and AIDS figured this out a long, long time ago, back in the 90s. And so you have your cocktail and it keeps you alive. And I have my cocktail and keeps it, but our cocktail's different. Right. Right. And our cocktail might change over time, but we're going to be on that cocktail for the rest of our days. Yeah. And it might be that the cocktail that I have is something I need to be on the rest of my days. And these are regimens. You know, I, I might have a sweet spot of how many times I walk. I might have a sweet spot of when I walk during the day. I get the best bang for my buck in the yeah. middle of the afternoon or first thing in the morning. Depends. You know, everyone's a little bit different. Um, but I get to figure out my signature and I get to hear from other people who've tried stuff that, that have worked and I could try it. I mean, it didn't work for me. Okay, I got to try something else. Right. Um, and that, that's kind of my, I'm going to craft my secret cocktail. And that's really what this product is all about. So it's about my ability to find out from others, others who I don't know, they could be half a continent or a continent away. And, and there's data on that that can be shared to say, hey, other people have tried this. It's worked really well. Give it a shot. Right. And then, uh, and how do you know if it works or not? Well, you get to track your data from time to time. And you get to say, you know what? I've got an improvement. Yeah. So I'm going to put the, this as a weapon for me to combat what, what's going on. Uh, but back to the point about, you know, uh, people with depression. Here's, here's what's really interesting. And I, I'd like to just present it to, this to you and the viewers. Okay. So, one of the interesting things about it is if we have data, we have people who have depression, who are highly resilient and very effective in their lives. And what can we learn about those things? So we need to change the narrative a little bit. If we look at the clinical tools, the clinical tools are worded in a negative fashion. So, you know, how many times have you felt uh, that you wanted to end your life? You know, how many times have you had trouble doing this? These are negative orientations. Well, after completing those kinds of questionnaires, you look at it and you go, this is really negative stuff. How is this affecting, just completing this, how is this affecting me? So can we flip it around? How many times have you jumped for joy in the last month? <laughs> yeah. how, many, how many times have you had a great meal with a, a friend? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So just flipping the nature of the questionnaires around doesn't doesn't invalidate the results. And we're not using this for research purposes. What we're saying is we're trying to put a positive approach on this thing. Why does it always have to be so negative? Yeah. So the narrative around it, and, and this is the real issue around stigma. And, and, you know, I think, you know, programs, you know, Bella talk, it's great. Yeah, right. we need to talk, but we need to reframe this. And, and I'll go a little bit further with that uh, shortly. So if we, if we present it in the positive, if, if I was an athlete, and, and I was a coach and I've done this, right? So, so I have an athlete. And if I'm always beating that athlete up about how poorly they're doing, I'm likely not going to get the best performance out of the athlete. Right. But if I frame it around, which is, why don't we try this? You know, we're getting okay results, but what if we could get some better results? And let's try this. And all of a sudden that positive feedback occurs. That's going to change things. And we have an approach in, 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 um, in coaching called bandwidth feedback, which means if the performance is, in an acceptable zone, we don't say anything. We say nothing. Silence is a very good tool. That's acceptable. If it's better than that, we say something. And if it's really terrible, we say something. But we don't necessarily frame it in a negative fashion. Right. That's the difference. And so a lot of these tool sets, while they're they're validated, they have a negative orientation yeah. around them. And yeah. from a from a continuous use perspective, that's not really good for people. The second no. thing is not only is a narrative negative. But, but what's, what's interesting is new research is now showing that actually mental health responses are adaptive. Okay. So these, the, which means if I, if I'm, I'm going along fine and all of a sudden I'm depressed, it's not that depression is a pathological response. It's actually a positive adaptive response. So depression is a manifestation of something, my way of dealing with some sort of difficulty or trauma in the world. 
And this is how I deal with it, which is it's not a negative reflection on you. No, this it's, is your an brain, appropriate. it's your brain doing what it's supposed to do. Right. And yeah. it's an appropriate. And what I have yeah. to do is now, you know, and brains rewire themselves, and now I need to do some new skills. So instead of saying to people, oh, you're depressed, it's this is your response to things. How can we make that your response to things better and better and give you more tools, better resiliency, more skills? Much like my daughter, right? She's she's a much stronger, better person. Um, and she's also an older person, so she's tried things over time, and and she's better able to cope with this. It doesn't mean she's going to cope with everything through yeah. her life. Likely, likely going to hit some walls. Right. Um, but but she's get she gets stronger as as time goes on. So that's a different way of looking at these things, which is they tend to be very good, not maladaptive, yeah. but adaptive approaches. Well, certainly. What uh, now? How uh, have you? What's the feedback been like since you know from users? Yeah, so, so from a user perspective, you know, the end user, the individual using it on their phone, very, very positive. So we have, we started actually in schools in the United States. Um, okay. now we're, now we're working in two different, well, actually three different places, I suppose. So, so, so what we've actually done is we, we've actually uh, repackaged it and, and, and putting it into the workplace setting, right? Okay. So this could be large corporations. It could be unions. It could be, uh, you know, fire departments or, you know, paramedic services, whatever the case may be, could be lawyers, could be salespeople. You know, you know, it, there's no bounds to this, right? right? There aren't professions that are, you know, uh, destined for for challenges. Although some professions <clears throat> have higher rates, you know, right. first responders have likely the highest rates in the military. Of you know, sort of one and two. Right. Um, <clears throat> but notwithstanding that, everyone has stuff going on in their lives. Some of it may be workplace related or personal. Right. You might have a child diagnosed with a very serious illness or or a car accident that occurs that that, uh, you know, uh, kills a family member or something. So um, so um, in, in a workplace setting, what's interesting about that approach is um, employers have a reason to invest in this type of a thing. Right. So if I look at it from a, you know, a business perspective, absolutely. We want to make uh, we want to do well for the world. Um but we also have a business that we're running here, and, and we want to, in a very uh, cheap and most scalable fashion possible, bring this to as many people as possible. Right. And workplaces are really good places to do it. We can prevent workplaces from finding out who is who. But, again, it need not be that I have to go to STD or LTD in order to get, get the help I need. Right. And I can, I, can, I can also combine that with other sources, you know, peer support, family and social support, my own, uh, my own walks, you know, walk with my dog or whatever the case may be, or go hiking, or, you know, maybe I need to go to the shooting range and, you know, blow off a bunch of bullets for 30 minutes or, or go to the archery range or go for a skate, like whatever works for me. Right. These are the things that I need to figure out with some feedback. Um, so we're, so we're bringing that to the workplace. And again, for our first foray, been good. I'm not satisfied with it. And we are, we've encouraged our users to say what works, what's lousy about it, what's right. great about it. Perfect. Um, and, 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 and because the, the product doesn't belong to us, the product belongs to our users, right? Yeah. We, we just, we just build it, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to hear from, uh, the Sean Conahans of, could you change this or change that? And that's what we're bringing into 2.0. And what we're really excited about 2.0 is not just our ability to support that in a workplace environment, or support that in a in a community based environment. So we're having discussions about that uh, to have that uh, combined. For instance, uh, we're talking with Children's Hospital right now um, because they want to use a, an outpatient basis, so they don't have to actually go to the hospital, and they want to deal with children and adolescents, right? right? And because three quarters or more of mental health issues are established when before the age of 21, mm -hmm. yeah, and almost all of them by 25. So so we need to. We need to we need to provide skills to people when they're younger, because the the, the sooner we get ahead of that, uh, the so, the better they're going to be able to cope, and 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 maybe even prevent things from getting too far along. Yeah. Um, so so we, you know you don't need to go across the line, and, and we well know that if you go across the line, it's much harder to get back on the other side of the line, right? Anyone who's yeah. been you know, any as we see this with the military, and not just with the military, but all of a sudden they go so far. Why didn't someone help them? Was there a pretty significant event, even not just a trigger event, but a pretty significant event? And the only way we're going to know that is to have some data on it. So, so we want to you know collect data, 
that really gives us a rich source and put new tools on it to say, well, we thought this about it. And we really know very little about mental health. Uh, you know, probably one percent, maybe mm-hmm. five if we're lucky. Yeah. But we we and we use a pathological approach. And, and you know, in the, in, in the old days, if somebody was having difficulty in a village, the village had resources, right? We had a much stronger sense of community. Right. People, they were connected, right? And connected connections matter. And and now we have. The paradox is we have these devices, these smartphones, which really kind of make us distance, distant from people, mm. but they all also allow us to bring people closer together, right? Yeah. So, so my daughter can text me from Lethbridge, or my other children yeah. can text me from the East Coast. We're a small well, community I'm, of millions of people. Right. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and it could it be the case that someone I don't even know could help me indirectly yeah. because of things, because I get to learn what's worked for them. Um, and, and the other thing we're adding to this is journaling. So okay. this is a really exciting area. So journaling is a very good therapeutic tool. Um, and I can journal on my phone or I can journal on my iPad or my computer or even on a watch if, you know, in a very simple way. Right. Um, but what's interesting is not only could I perhaps cr- create a questionnaire and use that periodically, uh, but I can journal. So, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm a medic and, and I experience something that's very traumatic, and I, you know, and part of the therapy, maybe I, I get some support. And say, you know, wh- wh- why don't you write down how you're feeling mm-hmm. every day? You know, do a daily journal. Okay, cool. Um, but what we can do now is on that journal is people can just write, and what we can do is is actually do sentiment analysis on it. So I'm writing, and and we discover that you know 30% of the words are positive words, and right. 20% of the words are neutral words, but 50% of the words are ne- negative words. So I'm, I might complete a questionnaire which says, you know, I'm only kind of in the yellow orange zone, but there's nothing red. Mm. But based on sentiment, based on what you're actually writing, yeah, it's it's not good. It's not good. Right. Right. And and so can we can we preempt something? Can we prevent something? And and so what we what we found is what's interesting about this to kind of circle back to the, you know, what we're doing in lab coat, which is in the clinical side and has it's not specifically about mental health, but in in head and neck cancer. And now in gastroenterology, um, what, you know, for people with IBD or Crohn's disease or, right. or all sort of colitis or whatever, um, and people recovering from very invasive head and neck cancer procedures surgically, right. or, you know, rebuilding their face, for instance, um, <clears throat> most of the research going on in that space, some of it is functional, sort of 25% to 30% of it's functional, but the vast majority of the follow-up of the individuals is in distress and depression and mental health issues. I find that fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, I look. I'm excited to see this 2.0 just because of the some of the changes that you mentioned, uh, Richard. I think it's going to be great. I think that you're on the right track, guys. Uh, this is this is definitely a piece of the puzzle that we, that needs to be included, you know, in overall mental health. If if people are listening, Richard, and they want to reach out to you, they want to contact you on social media or other means. How can they do that? Um, absolutely encourage anyone to reach at any time. You, our website is xd.ai. That's e x d e e dot a i. Um, our Twitter handle is at x d l t d e x d e e l t d. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, Richard LeBlanc in Calgary, Alberta. I, I do use Instagram, I think, or Snapchat <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm kind of old and uncool, but you know, I I I I, I struggle uh, yeah. with that sort of thing. But but absolutely uh, keen to to have individuals. Uh, you know, Sean, I, I'd be happy to share. Do 2.0. We got we got mock-ups now that are in a process. Oh, I'd be happy brilliant. to share that yes. with you. And Perfect. and we want to hear from 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 users. Yeah. Um. And 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 not just users, but also your listeners. Yeah. You know, so uh, you know, given you know, uh, it looks like you're going to expand your worldwide reach. That's great. And and if we can bring the message and the tools and the data to help people, that is our mission. This is a personal mission for me. It's not just a oh, yeah, professional mission. Absolutely, we, we definitely I can see that for sure. Uh, Richard, uh, I wrap this up the same way every time. So. If there's someone listening right now who is struggling on any level, if they were sitting in front of you, what would you say to them? Uh, I would say um, number one is yourself. So check in with yourself. Uh, take care of yourself. So you, there may be guilt and shame and, and all these strong emotional burdens, if you will. Um, but those aren't detractors. So so by all means, take care of yourself and, and bring, you know, it, it's a team sport. <laughs> Mental Mental health is a team sport, and so um, you may have people who have very different ways of helping and supporting you, 
Um, and, but don't look at them in a negative fashion. Some people are more comfortable than others. Right. But bring your team to play. If you're going to get out on the ice or get out on the field uh, to play, bring your team with you. And you'd be surprised at who's going to help you and when they're going to help you and in yeah. what method. You know, this is these are this is heuristic. It's entirely unknown. And 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 in your and you, in your darkest hour, um, you just you don't know who's going to be able to to bring it. <laughs> you know, right. Well and, said. Yeah. I mean. You're right. You're absolutely right, Richard. Um, listen, this has been awesome. I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, you're an interesting dude. The um, I want to thank you. I'd like to, you know, challenge you to continue not to be satisfied. You know, you mentioned that. I want you to continue to strive towards towards this, making changes, uh, being all inclusive. Uh, these are great. I, I want you to continue to do that because we need people like you doing the things that you're doing, like I say, in order to truly overcome this issue. So I want to thank you personally uh, for doing that. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for taking the time. Absolutely, Sean. My pleasure. Thank you again. We finally got to do this. Yeah. And I'll keep you apprised of any follow-ups over the next little bit before the podcast goes live. Perfect. And uh, we'll have a chance to circle back on that. And, and I look forward to the feedback from uh, from your listeners. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Oh, my and, pleasure. Uh, you know what? We're well, going to Lethbridge today, like I said. Yeah. And uh, I'll report back on that as well. Awesome. Have a safe drive. Have an awesome visit with your daughter. You know, continue to take care of you and your family and. You know, that's awesome. And again, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. All the best. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Now my shift is finally over. I got to deal with what's mine. I would like to thank Richard for taking the time to have this chat. Again, uh, really enjoyed it. I hope you did. Since uh, having the chat with Richard, he provided me with an update just a couple days ago. And I'm going to read it because it's long and I can't paraphrase it. And there's a lot of information in here that I don't want you to miss out. On So, here's what we got. Do 1.5 was released in late April. Do 2.0 will be released in June. Some of the key differences are as follows. Do 1.0, which came out in summer 2017, the central focus was of self-reporting. This allowed users to grasp an understanding of their score based on one or, one or multiple questionnaires while providing insight on changes to their scores with influences from weather, time of day, adherence, day of week, moon phase, activity, air pressure, daylight hours, temperature, and temperature variation. And this was unprecedented when this came out. Do 2.0, which comes out again in June 2018, more focus will be on self-care and support systems, a focus on internal attention and external outreach, will allow users to further understand their mental state, what aids them in longitudinal recovering. I said that well. I surprised myself. Where appropriate, and this will vary as time progresses. What prevents slippage and builds resilience, and what early interventions are needed when a serious, unexpected episode arises. Do 2.0 provides self-reliance and self-care, skill building paired with internal and external resources. This is created and accessed using three methods. One, personal interests and objectives. Uh, An example is my today, my goals, my results, my diary. Number two, feedback for recommendations using one as the primary point of skill building. Three, compliance of use and of compliance of use of recommendations. Three, Compliance of use of recommendations and personal decisions to retry or try something new. Presumably, people likely do not know what works or does not, so gauging across time is important. Also, seasonality and environmental factors contribute to the personal sine wave of mental health. Knowing the sine wave is critical to success. Also, he wanted me to let you guys know that they're looking into some key partnerships in the very near future. And that has been in the process uh, for some time. Number one, with a national mental health nonprofit to bring tailored content and resources via email, sorry, via e mental health to their clients at scale. This involves strong technical skills, digital peer support, digital caregiver support, and collaborating in a hacking discovery manner 
with their clients in real time. This complements face-to-face peer support, increasing accessibility and lowering costs considerably to build capacity. There's a strong chance that we're going to take some office space uh, together. This partnership will take some office space together in Calgary. Number two, we are in early discussions with a Fortune 50 company to complement their technology offering with ours, especially in peer support and self-service, two things they believe we complement them with them well with. They provide truly global marketing. It would be a strong combination and permit us to to extend a broad reach rapidly and them to have a platform that lets them establish strong market presence. Whew, that was a lot. Richard, you took full advantage of this update. Thank you for that. I would like to thank listeners again for supporting the podcast. I cannot make this podcast work without you. Absolutely does not work. So thank you. Thank you to those who share the podcast every time, who leave comments and feedback, who have subscribed. But you know what? Also thank you to those who just haven't been able to do that yet. And I understand that it may not be easy for people to share things of this nature. They're okay listening to them, and they do support them, in silence because maybe they're just not ready to share them yet you know what and I respect that so thank you for listening if that's all that you're capable of doing right now is listening I'm happy with that very happy for those of you that are that do share please keep doing so Uh, I do need the help and it does help the podcast immensely I don't usually do this but I'm going to talk about June June is PTSD awareness month so here's what's going down. Normally, Tematox comes out every two weeks. Not in June. In June, there's going to be at least seven episodes of Tematox in order to celebrate PTSD Awareness Month. So buckle up, rest up, clear some space on your phone. If that's how you listen to podcasts, you're going to need it. And the lineup is awesome. I don't usually do this either, but I'm going to tell you about the first one because we're going to start it off with a blockbuster. And I say it's a blockbuster only because of the global scale of this event. How many of you remember the Oklahoma City bombing? I do. It's one of those events growing up and in my young adulthood that stick out, that I remember. Remember where I was when it happened. Remember sitting in front of the TV watching it just being totally focused on everything. How many of you remember the picture of that firefighter holding the infant? Crazy, strong, powerful photo that I'll never forget. That firefighter is Chris Fields. In 2017, he retired from the Oklahoma City Fire Department. He is my guest for the first episode in June. And we go all through that event what that was like right from getting the call to responding to it being there going back to the station and how it affected Chris's life afterwards crazy powerful chat it was such an honor so if you're a firefighter or if you know firefighters please let people know this is coming because it is a must listen For all first responders, for everybody, really, but especially first responders and even more specific firefighters, you're going to really find this powerful. I'm not going to tell you the rest of June, but I wanted to tell you that. Please, as always, if you have any questions about TEMA, the TEMA Contra Memorial Trust, check them out at tema.ca. If you would like to help out or if you require any assistance, Please check them out. They have saved my life on more than one occasion. They are awesome. Again, I want to ask you to stop competing and start supporting. I did come up with that quote myself. One of the few. I think it's a good one. So I couldn't keep using it. And as always, please take care of yourself and each other. More love, less judgment. Cause we ain't superheroes, we're just ordinary people.
trying to make a difference and the first on every scene and it's a heavy heavy burden to carry 